Hello, everyone. My name is Forrest with Beyond Vizcaya, and I am the producer for this project uh, who's worked on putting together the videos and photos that you might have seen before. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar, Beyond Vizcaya is a community storytelling project that aims to tell the stories of the people that live in the community around Vizcaya and in Miami and who's made this place what it is today. So our project focuses on three particular themes, and that is labor, migration, and cultural identity. And today we are doing Doing a live stream featuring the labor portion of this project. So as you can tell from these giant doors behind me, if you aren't aware, this used to be the building that we're standing in is the garage. And this is where James Deering used to keep all of his cars and other pieces of machinery. And this building is located on the village side of the estate. So adjacent to this building is the mechanic shop where the machinery would be worked on. There's also an old blacksmithing shop right across and the superintendent's house as well. So we are in this location because we have a special guest with us today, our learning program facilitator, Mr. Alex Maldonado, and he will be sharing a few stories with us about the people that did the work that were behind the scenes that you don't normally hear about. So the people that did all the labor and made what uh, made this place what it is. So without further ado, here's Alex. Hi, so I'm here to tell you about three uh, particular figures, uh, Mr. William Dunsturuk, Theo Kaze, and Cecilia Adair. And so one of the most prominent workers from the early days of Vizcaya was William D. Sturrock. Mr. Sturrock was a Scotsman trained in botany from his youth at his father's nursery, and he migrated to the States to work with nurseries and flower shops in New York and New Jersey. He was brought into the Vizcaya project in 1914 as a landscape architect while working for the Griffin Brothers Company. At this time, Sturrock has his hand already in a great deal of projects that helped shape the gardens here at Vizcaya. Paul Chalfin, head designer for Vizcaya, relied on reports from Sturrock and his expertise in plant care to take advantage of the area's natural vegetation and incorporate it into Vizcaya. For instance, with the creation of the waterways that are at the entrance to the museum, they cut a path turning and changing size to protect as many good trees as possible. Sturrock was also responsible for acquiring plants to populate the gardens. This task would have in travel, such as when he found out that many of the good palms that he had planned to use down at Cape Sable were already gone. They were taken for other projects, and so he would have to get them from a new supplier in Havana, Cuba instead. This had its own share of headaches with transportation as well as securing permits, but he succeeded in bringing in and planting over 200 palms for the gardens. Uh, when he brought them in, surprisingly, not a single one of them died. When, are these palm when these palms were brought in, many of them were for the long causeway that bisects the lagoon gardens that are unfortunately now gone. But for the formal garden, several of the large oaks were also placed under his watch, and those continue to add to the sky's beauty to this day. Now, all this was an enormous amount of work. And so eventually, he had to go and devote his time exclusively to Vizcaya. And so he left the Griffin Brothers Company and joined Vizcaya in October. It was around that time that James Deering was now looking for someone who would take care of the estate fully. And he was looking for someone of a good ability, good habit, and someone who was good at growing things and had enough competence to keep the house in order mechanically. Chalfin and the others, they nominated Sturrock for the position. And so by December of that year, Sturrock was now brought on board as Vizcaya's first superintendent. Now, as, super, as superintendent, his his responsibilities continued with the gardens and he would continue to dictate a lot of our paths and a lot of the plants but he had a bit of a hand also with some of the buildings in the village most notably the superintendent office of which he is its he is its first resident now the superintendent office is a very nice building it's one of the fanciest uh, like houses here in the property outside of the villa itself it had a central loggia it had an office a laundry room kitchen and pantry it had a servant's quarters three bedrooms and on the south end it had a small garden which is still in use today now Sturrock would continue in this position up until September of 1917, when he would begin to train his successor, William McLean. And by the beginning of the following year, his duties were already set, his landscaping work was done, and he would move on to work at the Exotic Gardens, at the Exotic Gardens Company. Now, 
When James Deering had guests over, one of the most important aspects for the visit was, of course, food. Deering had, for this purposes, brought on a French chef, Vio Kaze, with who he was very happy with in 1920 at his summer home in Paris. So satisfied was he with Kaze's service that Deering offered him home. He brought him room and board for him and his family, a wife and two kids. So they got to stay here at the Eastgate Lodge at Vizcaya. When they arrived by November, November of that year, Kaze would prepare for Vizcaya a range of dishes from their frequent luncheons and outings. He would give them English breakfast to a variety of rich desserts. Deering himself enjoyed seafood with fresh Florida fish and lobster. Kaze would tailor a diet accommodating Deering in his declining health, but guests would never be restricted. Kaze would even follow Deering back to Paris to continue his duties as chef. With command of the kitchen at Vizcaya, Kaze had access to many amenities from a coal stove to a gas grill. Included in the house were refrigerators to provide ice, various molds for decoration, a bean grinder, a knife cleaner, and communications with the village to provide ingredients. The village had several buildings to, su to support and provide for the staff, including a poultry house, a two-story barn, a cow shelter, and large tracts of growing fields. From here, Kaze could call for any order of eggs, milk, butter, chicken, and an assortment of vegetables. The daily supply of meat would be provided by a Miami butcher. As mentioned, Theo Kaze was accompanied by his wife and two children, Janine and Roland. It was quite a trek to relocate from Paris to Miami, but the family settled in with Deering arranging for the children's education at a parochial school. The family was given gifts, such as a bike for Roland, and allowed free access through the grounds. Janine even got to keep pet rabbits behind the lodge. The Kaze family, like other families that lived in the grounds, were also able to take in some perks from living at Vizcaya, such as a supply of produce, daily eggs and milk at no charge. There were celebrations through the holidays, and once a year, the staff got to join Deering on his yachts for a picnic. And now, to keep this guy comfortable, Deering had a full staff to see to the needs of him and his guests. For this, he had a squad of seven maids and two footmen, and leading this effort is the housekeeper, Cecilia Adair. Miss Adair came to Vizcaya from Chicago with previous experience from work at the Ogden Armour Estate at Lake Forest, Illinois. She had her own quarters at Vizcaya and was tasked with its daily maintenance, a job which she took to quite happily. Her day started early at 7.30 for breakfast, which would be in the staff dining room that they had right by the kitchen. Afterwards, she would give daily orders to the parlor and upstairs maids and set out the linen for the day while the footman polished the silver and floors. She would receive flowers from the gardeners to, to place throughout the rooms and coordinated with the butler to arrange whatever comforts Deering and his guests deigned. At Vizcaya, there are dozens of decorated rooms, and so there's an impressive number of things to keep clean and organized. There's 1,200 towels, 1,200 linen sheets, six lathe tablecloths, 12 damask tablecloths with matching napkin sets, five chests of flat silver, and 24 sets of fine china for a variety of uses from informal dining to tea and desserts. There were 12 bathrooms with silver-plated plumbing, the master bathroom with gold, and a museum's worth of artifacts to keep free from dust and dust and wrinkles. Adair would inspect every fabric to keep them in pristine condition. And so she utilized daily seamstresses who worked in vast sewing rooms to keep fabrics good and new as laundresses were able to work at the estate's own laundry building equipped with copper tubs, ironing boards, laundry ringers, and mangles. Now Adair's job was not done when Deering would leave in the spring either. On Deering's departure, the house would be transformed. Much of the furniture would be cleaned and covered with sheets before being moved and stored. The rugs would be rolled out. And thankfully, due to her devotion to Vizcaya, she would continue to work for 36 years for the house, long after the original owner had passed away. Now, if there's any other questions, I would be happy to answer, but I hope you all had a wonderful insight into some of the, the labor way back during Deering's day. Oh, yes, and please follow Beyond Vizcaya for more information on Vizcaya's history.